Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, we can do better than that, York College. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, that'll pass. Uh, my name is Dr. Ron Daniels. I'm distinguished lecturer in the Department of Behavioral Sciences here at York College, also president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century. And I'm honored to have been asked today to moderate this very important discussion. First and foremost, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedules as students and all the different things that you have to come to this very important discussion on an issue of vital importance to our college, to this community, to the country, and in some ways, uh, actually to the world. I first want to do some acknowledgments. Um, this program is being made possible by the Men's Center. Jonathan Quash is somewhere out here. Let's give Jonathan a round of applause for his work. The Women's Center, you'll be hearing from Ebony Jackson later, but Ebony is the director of the center. The Department of Behavioral Sciences is involved. Uh, the Student Government Association, let's give them a round of applause. Student Government Association. Uh, Mar uh, Marcia, Mrs. Marcia Comrie and the uh, and Institutional Advancement played a role in helping to put this together. Certainly the Performing Arts, um, uh, Performing Arts Center staff that has helped with the technical arrangements, Dan Phelps from ed Educational Tech, as well as the Equal Opportunity Center students. Are, are, is the Equal Opportunity Students Center here? Are they here? Yeah? Anyway, they'll be here shortly. So let's give all of them a big round of applause. I <laughs> uh, want to express uh, President Keyes would have been here this morning, president of our institution. Uh, she sends regrets because she is uh, off at a very important uh, conference. Uh, so we just want to acknowledge that. I want to give you a word about how we intend to conduct the format today. Very shortly, you'll be hearing from Ebony Jackson, who is going to provide framing remarks for the conversation. We have an outstanding panel, which I'll be introducing, that will be engaging in a conversation about the issues related to domestic violence and all of the nuances and subtleties of same. Uh, after which, we want to get you involved. Uh, there will be a comment period, not, not necessarily a Q&A period, but a comment period in which you can come up and you can say what you think or what you feel. And if there's a burning question you'd like to put, you certainly can do that. But it's not the traditional Q&A format. It's really an opportunity for you to say how you feel, uh, what's on your mind. Uh, you may want to react to what you've heard. And in some ways, I'd be interested in challenging some of the men in the audience, in particular, uh, to, to come out and to talk about their feelings. Because there's a way in which very often these things are seen as, quote unquote, women's issues, and it's not really a women's issue, it's a total issue, and men have to be involved in the solution as well. So we, I would be very interested in hearing from the men. Uh, after that, we'll have a summary of remarks from the panel, um, about two minutes each, uh, and then after that, we'll, we will have concluded. So now I'd like to bring uh, to the podium for framing remarks, Ebony Jackson. Um, Ebony is the current manager of York's College's Women's Center. Uh, she holds a Master's in Business Administration from Columbia University and a Bachelor of Arts in Government and Foreign Affairs from the University of Virginia. Her strength and passion has always been with student outreach and advocating on their behalf. To that end, she works to engage students through the Women's Center, where her signature programs are the are Women of Excellence, Monitoring Services, series, I'm sorry, and the Women's Empowerment Film series focused on educating and empowering students of York College. She also serves on the York College Domestic Violence Committee. Would you please welcome warmly Ebony Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. And thank you all for, for being here uh, this morning, or should I say this afternoon. So um, first on behalf of the Women's Center, the Men's Center, the Division of Student Development, the Department of Behavioral Sciences, and the Student Government Association, I want to thank you all for being here today. 
Um, I also want to thank our esteemed panel. I'm excited um, to have such a uh, learned and dynamic group of folks here to share with the York College community. Um, and I can't wait to hear all of the discussion that ensues today. I want to commend all of you for being here. We have a nice uh, large group, and I know that you guys have tons to do in terms of studying and working, so I'm happy to see so many students out here today. Um, domestic violence is pervasive in our community, and it's something that we talk about in the Women's Center quite a bit. Um, on Monday, September 8th, TMZ released the video, the clips, uh, a little bit of which that we just saw, of Baltimore Ravens' Ray Rice, um, where he proceeded to knock out his then fiance, Janae. Although the incident was very public, and it actually occurred in February, this was the first time that we, the public, were able to see the evidence of a man in his peak physical condition uh, to uh, brutalize a woman and he literally knocked her out cold and dragged her from the elevator where the incident occurred. And while I think in the clip that we heard were correct, it didn't change the situation, it was the first time that we were able to see it. And I know that myself and a lot of the women in the Women's Center and people in the community had a very visceral reaction to seeing the brutality. Um, a lot of times students see it in their home life, but when it happens to famous people, right, which was the, the point on the video, we all get to kind of stand in awe and shock. After that happened, coincidentally, we had just done a domestic violence event a couple of days before that video came out. And it wasn't long before uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Ron Daniel, sent an email out to some key folks here at the York College community and stated that this was, to use an Oprahism, a teachable moment. Right? This is a teachable moment for us to shine the spotlight on this vital issue. And that's what we're here to do today. That's what we're here, all of the panelists, as well as all of you. Those of you who are uh, sitting out in the audience will notice that I believe on every seat there was a uh, fact sheet with some statistics about domestic violence. Okay? Um, and it just gives us some, some, some stats to, to frame this epidemic, right? Um, on the sheet, uh, there, was, there was so much, I decided to just keep it to, to one page. Uh, we could have had pages and pages of statistics about, about domestic violence, all right? But one of the um, things was that according to uh, a 2013 Global Review, some stats have put the, um, uh, the number at 35%, some as high as 70% of women worldwide have experienced either physical and or sexual or intimate partner violence. 35 to 70% worldwide, that is a huge number, all right? We also talked about um, how in terms of women in college, all right? One in eight or 13% of female co college students surveyed has said that they had been stalked or abused within a nine month period. All right, more than 57% of college students who reported having been in an abusive or dating relationship said it occurred while they were in college. So I want our students here to be vigilant. And I want you guys to understand what this means, right? This is numbers on a paper, but all of you guys um, have some experience for yourself or people that you know who may be in a situation like this, all right? The last thing on this sheet is probably the most important, and that is that most domestic violence incidents are never reported, right? This whole sheet of statistics is interesting, but a lot of the incidents we never hear about because this issue is swept under the rug. It's surrounded by feelings of shame and humiliation, and people just don't want to talk about it, okay? But this event is our opportunity to shine the light on the issue. This event is our opportunity to make sure that nothing gets swept under the rug. Because only by dealing with it head on are we gonna be able to make some changes in our community, okay? Lastly, I wanted to just say that this is, um, I think of all of your College this way, but today here at this event, this is a safe space, all right? And we want to make sure that anyone who is here who may be a survivor of domestic violence and wants to share their experience feels free to do so. 
we're all here in, uh, to educate and empower you, but also in love and support of anyone who may have had an opportunity. Okay, we want to make sure that this event is not about men bashing. I'm happy to see we have so many men here. It's not about victim blaming. We're here to gain insights and we want to find some solutions to this vital issue that's plaguing our community. So I want to thank everyone again for being here. With that, I will hand it back over to our uh, Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Daniels. Thank you. Okay, a big round of applause for our di director, manager of our Women's Center, Ebony Jackson. And now we want to introduce our panel, and what an extraordinary panel it is. Uh, starting from my right and your left is Professor Katarina Amukri, who is a PhD doctor, that is, assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Sciences. She's also a licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, she has um, more than 15 years of experience using cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, and mindfulness-informed approaches to treat adolescents and adults with anxiety and depressive disorders. Would you please welcome Professor Mukri. <laughs> Next to her um, is Donna Cherico. She is professor of psychology and currently serving as the interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Cherico is also the chair of the faculty and staff advisory council of the John D. Calendra Italian American Institute and serves as its faculty research consultant. Dean Cherico. Next to her is uh, Dr. Selena T. Rogers. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work and the School of Health, uh, Health Sciences and Professional Programs at York College. She's also an internationally recognized social work scholar and educator. In fact, you see her picture out when you come in the door. You can't miss her. She's, all, she's over everything. Every time you come in, you have to greet her. Winning distinction of a Fulbright Specialist from the United States Department of State, Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. Would you please welcome Professor Rogers. And to my immediate left is Tanya McCloy. She is a manager of, she's a manager of community organizing for Voices of Women, the Voices of Women Organizing Project. Uh, she's a domestic violence survivor and advocate. She is currently overseeing and coordinating uh, VOW's three main campaigns, which focus on improving New York City family courts, stopping false and malicious child abuse reports by abusers, and ensuring that victims of domestic violence and their children receive faith, safe and affordable housing. Uh, let's give a round of applause also for Tanya McCoy. And next to her, you saw her in the video, right, already? So we have a star. You can get an autograph after the program from Terry Williams. <laughs> Terry's an old friend, by the way. <laughs> Terry Williams is one of Ebony Magazine's Power 150 for activism. Uh, Women's Day Magazine's 50 Women on a Mission to Change the World, and a Black History Makers honoree on the 2013 Grio 100 list. Terry's critically acclaimed book entitled Black Pain, uh, it's just, it just looks like we're not hurting. In 2008, it's credited with start starting an unprecedented national dialogue that recounts her personal struggles with depression and the impact the stigma of mental illnesses have, particularly on African and the African American community. And I might say she has a long resume also, but I just want to say that Terry also has a foundation and she has helped innumerable young people. I mean, she mentors them, and she just has so many success stories. Please give it up for Terry Williams. OK. All right, I've got to find my papers here. Oh, and finally, last but certainly not least, is actress, author, life coach, and inspirational speaker Madeline McC uh, McCray. I'm sorry. Um, she is a domestic violence survivor as well, and she addresses the issue from a healing and broad-based perspective. Uh, Ms. McRae is critically acclaimed for her co-starring opposite Emmy-nominated actor John Amos 
and Isaiah Washington in August Wilson's Pulitzer Prize winning play Fences and Susan Laurie Parks' Imperceptible Mutabilities of the Third Kingdom. Would you please give it up for Ms. McRae? As I indicated at the beginning, we're going to have a conversation, and um, we wanted to begin where, with the fact sheet that uh, the Women's Center and the Men's Center prepared, and that is talking about sort of the definition of domestic violence and getting a sense of how pervasive it is, I mean, sort of paying the picture of domestic violence in this country, and some might even say in the world. So we're going to ask um, our panelists to address that. I think I'll start with Professor Mukri. And then anyone else who wants to address that question can do so. So we can slide the microphone down and uh, get started. Thank you again for organizing this, everybody. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to, um, You're gonna have to put it all out there and uh, lay all the different issues on the tables, including myths, uh, misperception, misconceptions around domestic violence. Um, I don't need to reiterate all of the different, uh, different statistic figures you've heard earlier when uh, Ms. Williams uh, went over it with you. I think it is important to note that it is an underreported problem. So many, many more people are affected by this. And uh, this is a really important venue to begin to discuss how we can repair and move forward. Okay, uh, let's turn to this side. I'd like to hear from uh, Tanya and uh, Ms. McRae because you, you've experienced this. Mm -hmm. So would you share with us just your perspective on it in relationship to your experience, if you wanted to do that, but also because you've become involved in this, I'm sure you've had to talk to many, many women who've also been involved and perhaps some men. And we're gonna ask that question in a minute. So why don't we start with you? Okay, that's great. And speak strongly <laughs> to the microphone. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I don't want to be too loud here. Uh, yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Madeline McRae. Uh, I am uh, working always on the uh, topic and issue of domestic violence. I know it, yes, from a personal experience. And I realize very much that it's a really complicated issue, it's not black and white, sometimes it gets really gray. My particular uh, incidents happened many, many years ago. My oldest son is 41 and my youngest son is uh, 40 years old. So my uh, experience with it was a long time ago, but uh, there were many lessons that have been um, lifetime lessons that I took out of that. And one of the uh, things that I just would like to say briefly is regarding that hashtag, why I stayed, why I left. Um, basically, I left and I stayed because I was in love. And I left and I stayed because I love my sons and I loved their father and I wanted them to grow up knowing what it was like to have a healthy relationship, and I understood that that wasn't going to happen if they grew up witnessing the people that they were born to love at each other's throats all the time. It's a big old issue, um, and we'll go, I could go on and on, but I won't. I know that Tanya has some stuff to share, and we'll just move it over. Thank you, good afternoon. Is that too loud? I have a full voice. Um, my name is Tanya McLeod. I am a survivor of domestic violence. And talking about the statistics, um, oftentimes the systems that are put in place to support that victim of DV and their children fail. What does it look like to leave an abusive relationship? Well, let's think about that. That victim may have to leave their apartment, their job, the children may have to be transferred to different schools. She may have to go into hiding like I did with my three sons at the time. And um, so the systems need to work. And again, the court systems, housing options, being able to uh, re have resources to feed your children. A lot of times the abusers who control the households control the funds. So again, I'll just throw that out there. Okay, uh, let's go to this side again. Uh, Dean Cherico, um, any observations you'd like to make on the question of the sort of scope and the nature of the crisis? 
I, I think that since we started with Ray Rice, I want to just say a little something about sports and domestic violence. Because many of us see sports as a way to get young people out of impoverished communities. So we want our kids to pursue basketball, to pursue football. But you need to understand is what kind of a culture you are sending young people into when you send them into a place like the NFL. And, I, and the statistics you don't have are the NFL statistics. Because you may not be aware of it, but there is something called the NFL Arrest Database, just to show you how prevalent crime is in certain places. And there is no question that the rate of domestic violence as a crime in the NFL is their biggest concern. For example, domestic violence accounts for 80, for 48 percent of arrests for violent crimes among NFL players compared to 21 percent nationally. So when we inculcate this idea of aggression and violence in young people, it should not come as a shock when that becomes their mode of operation in all circumstances. So I wanted to stress the point that we have a responsibility to correct this. And we have a responsibility to make sure that young people who go into sports understand that that behavior stays on the field and doesn't go into the bedroom. And it's something that we sometimes lose track of, that we have set up these young people. And don't forget, these are very young people in the NFL and the various leagues. So that's just one point I want to bring forward as we talk about how do we address the problem. Professor Rogers. Good afternoon. Um, to extend uh, Dean Cherko's conversation, I think it's really critical to understand the socialization of gender roles. Um, I often talk about this in um, my class. I see a lot of my students here. We have to be very clear that the socialization begins very early on, and then it manifests itself as adults. I need to go a step back, though, and um, deal with it from a historical context where women, and in particular, African American women, black women, um, dehumanized. Um, not even having a right, being viewed as property. So when you begin to unlearn those behaviors that are continuously reinforced, and I really appreciate the dialogue that was happening over here, and I appreciate your referring um, not only to yourself as a victim, but also as a survivor, speaking to the results of healing. But I think it's critical to understand that systems do fail. And if we're only trying to see them through one lens and thinking that there's only one way and there's a disproportionate rate of our children going into child welfare if they don't leave. I appreciate you said you made an attempt to sustain your family unification. However, that's not everybody's narrative. And I just think there needs to be diversity in the conversation. Okay. Uh, Terry Williams, uh, anything you'd like to add to what's been said on this, this aspect of it? Um, yes, I just, I just wanted to put some things in, in, into perspective, and um, one of the things is that all of us inherit the unresolved pain, wounds, trauma, and scars of our parents, and that you don't ever know what a person's journey has been. They just, we all wear a mask, don't you all agree? Everybody wears a mask, and you just never really know who you're dealing with, and I was, I was in an emotionally abusive business relationship, and I learned a lot from, from that. But what I, what I do know is that when we interact with people, the question we want to ask is, what's wrong with that person? But the real question that needs to be asked and isn't often answered is, what happened to that person? Because that tells the whole story. And so I just wanted to provide that context and that we have to be careful to assess what our own needs are so that we don't get into relationships that are unhealthy for us. And the thing is, we know when something's wrong. I knew with this, I knew in this particular relationship, I knew something was wrong. And I think that we have to learn to follow our gut and to, to have the courage and the strength to move away from a situation that is potentially unhealthy. And an, another thing is that I think not boy, boys, young boys, when you, the sister was speaking about sports, men are born, bred, and raised to suck it up to be a man and to not show emotion. And uh, the reality is that I think that a lot of us, and I speak about this often, that 
a lot of us have anger issues. I know I do. Did anybody in here willing to say you have anger issues? That's all. Stop lying. <laughs> so I'm just saying that, and those are, those are issues that a lot of times uh, we don't seek therapy for. But I think it's really a gift to, to have that you can talk about some of the issues that are in your life that cause you to stay in a relationship stay in a relationship that's not healthy. So I just wanted to just kind of share those, those things. Very good. I wanted to ask um, a couple of questions that I, I've heard some from some of my students and, and we kind of hear in the air. The two questions and they may be interrelated, well maybe they're not interrelated. One question has to do with the issue of she deserved it. I mean there was, there, there, there was a discussion of we don't know what happened in the elevator um, beforehand. In fact, there was some discussion that maybe she may have spat on him. And so therefore, there was some justification for it. And I think there is a thread of this, just as in instances of rape and whatever, and that somehow is there. The other issue I want to address, raise the question of, is male domestic violence, or domestic violence against men. Because in many of the programs, there was a very strident sort of conversation, many coming from men, who I'm sure were you know, trying to make sure they were in good shape, that there's never ever a justification for a man hitting a woman. Maybe that's the case, but I would like to at least ask these sort of somewhat <laughs> controversial questions. You know, what about this issue of uh, women deserving it or being, having provoked it? And on the other hand, are there instances of women committing domestic violence against men? Absolutely. absolutely. Of I'm not trying to answer the question, but absolutely, because women, or human beings have, oh, human beings have normal emotions, and so I would just, yeah, there's many cases of that. It's just not considered, and I think it's it's a touchy kind of sort of situation. I I do, huh? I was just gonna go say ahead. That. Go ahead. No, I'm finished. Really. Um, well, it is a taboo topic because oftentimes victims of domestic violence, they get out of their abusive relationships and they say, never again. And then sometimes the effects of domestic violence leads them to become um, so aware of any little thing that may trigger exactly. what yes. happened to them. So young. not right, when they were younger or even in that abusive relationship because a lot of us are child witnesses of domestic violence, but we didn't recognize that it was domestic violence. Just like the officer told me, you're a battered woman. And I was like, battered who? I, I hit him back until I was <laughs> nine months pregnant and couldn't fight anymore. So oftentimes women may reverse that and because they've been so battered and because they've been so bruised and have watched their moms and, and aunts and so forth and so on, they will strike out first. So. Um, men are also victims and we believe at VOW that any form of domestic violence is not acceptable. Anyone else want to weigh in well, to go back to the issue of uh, is there any justification, there is no justification for ever raising your hand to anyone. We're looking at it from the wrong side though because for that individual who has, we just described them as anger issues, but obviously it runs much deeper than that. If your consistent pattern is that you've been raised every time something happens to you, you get frustrated, you get angry, that you lash out with your hands, regardless of what's going in, on in your head, you may not be able to stop yourself. So that's why, especially someone like Dr. Macru, who works in cognitive behavioral theories, where you can get an individual to kind of stop, right? That's the issue, stop, and don't react the same way you've been reacting. So that's another piece of this, that it's not so much the provoking, it's that you can't stop yourself. Think of your own selves and behaviors you have that you want to change, but you can't stop. Right? And this is one that's very dramatic, but it's still a cognitive behavioral issue about how to change. I don't know if you want to address that. Um, yes. Um, I think it's all, there are two different, I want to piggyback on that, and anger is certainly one element, not being able to regulate oneself, and we all can do a better job with that. I think all around everybody can improve on how we can control and manage our emotions. Um, in, in, in many cases, though, anger is not the only issue. As, as Dean Kiriko says, there, it, it runs deeper than that. Many of these instances 
The men are perfectly capable of managing their anger and frustrations when it counts. So at jobs, at, with, with um, co-workers. I mean, I would not be surprised to, uh, if this is one of the reasons why there's so many supporters of rice. You know, because they can't imagine, they can't fathom this person who might be able to be able to regulate in cer 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 certain circumstances, but not with his spouse. So there's this selective, you know, why is it okay to demonstrate anger towards your wife, your girlfriend, your spouse, but you're able to regulate that in other circumstances. So there's that piece too. Um, and of course, no one size fits all. You know, so in some circumstances, we have anger being a main issue, and in others, it runs deeper than that. But uh, change is possible, although it is very difficult. We, uh, so the sad, sad truth is that um, you need to have an attitude of willingness and openness to make a change. And the data we have about uh, treating batterers are quite sad. Um, usually isn't very effective when you mandate someone to therapy. They're not, their heart and soul are not in it. So uh, that's something I know we'll talk a little bit more about change and, and uh, interventions, but I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, I think I'll take Tanya and then yes, please. Go ahead. Tanya. I just wanted to piggyback on that. Um, at Val, we've just begun presenting to batterers who've been mandated to attend a battery intervention program um, called the PAC program. And I also want to share, I'm the mom of three sons and a daughter, and my 20-year-old last year recently battered his girlfriend to the tune of fractured ribs. So I just wanted to share that because domestic violence doesn't end when she just leaves that relationship. The effects of domestic violence is like a tornado and it destroys everything. And oftentimes children who witness that, they absorb it and they don't know how to let go of that behavior or they feel like they couldn't save that mom that they saw being beaten. So they grow up and they become men and it comes out in other ways. So at VOW, we're survivors of domestic violence and for the past six months, we've been presenting our stories to um, batterers who are mandated, letting them know that this is a community issue and we need your help to stop and break this cycle. I think um, another critical point to consider is that the violence, as I said earlier, doesn't begin when individuals become adults. So how does it transform from, you have a child, you do something, I spank your hand, that's out of love, right? You're my parent, you're my guardian. That gets reinforced. And so at some point, it's very difficult to make the distinction between that's discipline versus you have social control over me. That's one thing. Two, um, there's some powerful brothers out here, uh, Ted Bunch and Tony Porter, that are holding men accountable. And I think when we understand that collective framework as it's a public health response and it's not a private issue and I know that that becomes very difficult from a cultural standpoint because people you know from that place deal with it very differently but one of the things that's important is if we continue to isolate the problem and not understand how we all have a responsibility globally everyone has to do their part everyone sitting on this panel has a different perspective a collective perspective but we all have to have a response we cannot be idle bystanders and watching violence happen, whether it's women, whether it's men being violated, because it does happen, whether it's individu individuals in the LGBTQA community, it's happening. We have to have a reaction to this. We cannot be idle anymore. It's unacceptable. We should not be having Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Really? It doesn't happen in October only. It happens all the time. One in seven, every few minutes. Come on, people, we got to rise up. It's time. Okay, um, let's move on to the next uh, question. And, and I, I think uh, it was stated that there can be, I mean, violence, of course, in general is bad. There can be violence, uh, women against men, and so therefore there can be cases where there is domestic violence, uh, women against men. However, I think it's, I think, fair to say that overwhelmingly this issue is one of men committing violence against women. Um, so let's get into the next round of questions, uh, and, and this we've already morphed into it, and that's the why. 
And let's just do two at a time. Let's do the why and let's begin to talk about prescriptions for change. Because again, if we're gonna solve this problem, and I think we've already begun to open it up, you know, we need to know to cure, we must know what the, what in fact the disease is or what the nature of the problem is. So exactly. who wants to? I'd like to respond to that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, it, well, obviously there's no one size and fits all. But one thing for sure is that we have to acknowledge what is happening in children's lives, what they're watching, and what, how their experience to their surroundings is. We can't, um, to break the cycle is going to require everyone acknowledging that when they see a little boy getting st stomped, slapped, um, uh, dis, uh, just absolutely disempowered as a child, that that rage is going to come somewhere, from somewhere, it's going to go somewhere after that. And the same is true from, for a little girl. We have a tendency, and it is a taboo topic in our communities, where you know this whole notion of spare the rod, spoil the child. And the, being able to tell the difference between what is acceptable and, and what is not. We look at the NFL, and we look at an Adrian Peterson and a man who says, Wow, I know I'm not an abuser. I got whipped with a switch when I was a kid, and I know that that's absolutely true, but they also follow it up with this. They will always say, I, and, and I turned out okay. But the truth of the matter is, they didn't turn out okay. They turned out for whatever good that, it was, that they have done, and there can be a lot of good, in spite of the fact that they endured that kind of pain. So we have to really be honest with our conversations and not hide behind whether, you know, whether or not it's going to air our dirty laundry. We simply have to do that. Women are disrespected around the world. A woman's life is devalued everywhere. We live in a patriarchal society and that is just the reality of it. But when we engage our men, when we decide that we're gonna save our men and save our boys the same way we're gonna save our girls and our women, that's how I believe that we will begin to rein this problem in and teach each other how to love each other in healthy ways in our relationships. On this one, I'm just gonna go right down the line. So, Terry, if you would go next. Yes, I was going to say that, um, you know, Thank you, I do. A lot of times when we, when we walk the streets, we see people who are very, very, abu adults who are very, very abusive to the young, young children in their lives. You see them like smacking them up, shut up and do this or do that, or actually just really hitting them. And I think that there are some things that we can do as, as, as someone who's a stranger to maybe just perhaps put a hand on the woman or the man who is going off in that way and just saying, are, are you okay? To try, to try to break them from whatever it is that has allowed them to go into an, an area that might have, they might have had some, there was some kind of trigger that made them decide to go off in that way. And I just want to say that there are things, you know, within reason where if you see somebody um, yelling at a kid, we know that that's destroying that kid's spirit. And so I think that those are some things that we could do. The other thing is, to um, just to think think about some of the people in your life who may have angered you, because that's the that's the crux of it. Think about that. Think about five things that you do when you become angry. Um, list things that you say when you become angry, because things can escalate. Um, and and just that the reason I mentioned the importance of therapy, and a lot of us don't believe in going to therapy, but when you are sitting there in that silence and you have that space to yourself, many things come up inside of you, things that may have happened to you when you were younger and you never really processed how it affected you. And I can't, I, I never forget this story about six, seven years ago, there was a young girl, she was 16 years old, living with her honor student um, cousin and her aunt. Long story short, one day she stabbed her cousin, the 16 year old stabbed her cousin 49 times slashed her throat, took her iPod and the sneakers off her feet. 
She's in prison for life. But what I'm saying is, what happened to me? What happened to that little girl? Somebody must have violated her body or violated her spirit, and she had nowhere to go with it and never got help. So that's why I want to talk about the importance of us getting help, all of us. I want to go back to what Dr. Rogers shared about the socialization of boys and girls and gender roles. Um, as when I was a victim of domestic violence, my ex-husband taught me early on that if I tried to leave him, that he was going to kill me and take my kids. And in fact, he did kill my dog um, with his bare hands. And um, you can Google that, Tanya's story. And um, I have actual footage. My ex-husband abused me and my children through videotape. He would just tape us and send messages. And these are subliminal things that batterers do. They don't always have to use their hands to touch you. But as a mother of three sons, once my ex-husband was arrested and incarcerated, he served two and a half years of jail time for the abuse he inflicted on me and my kids. And I was, be I was able at that moment to say, now I can breathe. And I began the process of reclaiming my life. I began the process of recognizing that I'm raising men. So I had to change my view on what my ex-husband did to me and my children because I didn't want my sons to go through life and make that choice. And I, I exposed them to positive male role models in the community. That was something that I did, basketball, skills on skates, swimming. I did everything that I could. I repainted our home. My ex-husband painted my kitchen walls black. So I was living in a pit of hell. But I, I just want to move it on and just say that education, giving um, society the tools to heal, the tools to say, what are the choices I can make? There is a difference between anger and power and control. Thank you. Mm, very good. Yes. I'm left -handed. So I think um, just in terms of why do people stay, um, a lot of it has to do with one's loyalty to community, to family, um, racial loyalty, uh, spiritual, um, space and when I say spirit, I think I need to say kind of more organized religion. Um, Dr. Trisha Bent Goodley does a lot of work in that area in terms of churches, and she happens to be one of my mentors. And it's important to understand that people want the violence to stop. They don't necessarily want their circumstances to change in terms of you know the dismantling of their home lives and the dismantling or the taking away of their children or their their loved ones because again it still is love not being in a household they just truly want the violence to stop and so I think when we think about um, responses the responses have to start very early on um, I do a lot around mentoring um, not just with females but you know males and, and and females and the mentoring really helps people to learn or relearn or own and understand the value that they have in themselves that they may not have been taught. For many years, I, I grew up in, in Harlem, went to Norman Thomas High School, and I would go back and do these different talks, and I would say, during my talk, just stand up and say, I believe in myself. One young man came up to me afterwards and was like, I can't tell you that because I don't believe that. I've never been told that. So that really reinforced to me that I have an obligation to every young student I come across, and not even young, just people I come into contact with. I have an obligation to address mentoring, leadership, self-worth, and dignity. I don't care if I'm doing it here in the United States or abroad. I must make that commitment to you, myself, and everybody I know. Finally, I just want to say, from a, a social work educator standpoint, the curriculum one of the things that's important to me is any study that I do has to be infused in what I teach. I need to make sure that the social competencies and the social work, um, what we're held accountable for in terms of our accrediting body, is infused into my teaching. If it's not, then I'm not doing my job. So that is really critical for me as an educator. I mean, we. We understand that we live in a male-dominated society, a patriarchy we have for thousands of years. That has not changed. But what has changed in 2014 is the role of the media and the internet and the way information is handled and how these stories come to us. 
You have all heard about Ray Rice and Adrian Peterson. How many of you are aware that there have been 13 arrests for domestic violence in the NFL since February? Right? And have you read those stories and how half of them have already been dismissed? I mean, so the media takes stories and because of a person's position or because of the way something is done, it changes the way we think about the situation. Just yesterday, uh, Slava Voinov, who plays in the NFL, was arrested for domestic violence, plays for the LA Kings. Go read the story. Go read the story of how they describe him. The first sentence is, Voinov is a soft-spoken individual. So already the media is telling you how you should have empathy for this person. And that's where we have a responsibility, as all of our panelists have said today, of keeping people honest and making people understand what this is. And I just want to give you a, a brief way you can do this. Talk to children. Talk to your children. And I will describe a disturbing change I see in our society that frightens me. How many times have you walked along Jamaica Avenue and you see a woman or a man with a baby in a stroller or a toddler in a stroller, and instead of talking to the toddler, instead of interacting with the toddler and making sure that toddler child feels connected, they're on their cell phone instead. Right? We are losing opportunities to connect to the next generation. And I think that this is something that frightens me, because it's the feeling connected, supported, that you are valued that will allow that child, that person, to change. And without that, we're going to lose something. And, and I'll say one more time, it frightens me incredibly. Thank you for all these wonderful insights. And I want to just piggyback on what everybody's been saying so far, that um, we have to start early. And everybody has to be involved from the individual level, family level, community, society. We need to challenge these strict gender roles and uh, really work with women not to learn to internalize you know, how others see us as objects, as things to possess. I mean, this is why, again, how is it that in some cases, men can selectively choose who they let out their anger towards. That's because they don't think of us as an equal, as uh, worthy of a voice, worthy of opinions and, and help. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. Um, and I want to also just highlight the fact that, you know, abusive relationship takes time to build. It is a process. If, if um, physical violence occur the very first date, we would have fewer people tolerating it. The fact is, it is a gradual process of uh, manipulation, of, take, of uh, really chipping at one's self-worth, one's ability to uh, stand for themselves, social isolation, preventing the women from contacting their families and resources and uh, financial dependence. All of these different variables are really against, uh, you know, against women for being able to break through this pattern. So understanding those elements can help us to be able to build resources to address financial dependence, to address uh, you know, affordable housing, ways to be able to access help. Um, the, other, the last thing I want to mention is that you know, along with the gradual process of uh, abusive relationship is you know, we all, no one likes to think of themselves as a victim. You know, we all have certain self-image. And so our tendency is always to kind of explain away incidents that don't quite fit with how we view ourselves. That's how we stick, stick around. Um, you know, incidents, we might ex incidents of uh, violence or uh, emotional or abusive statements, we might write it off as, oh, you know, they're just having a really bad day, or, you know, it's not representative of who they are, because the idea of seeing yourself as being a victim um, is so far from how you see yourself that you reject these evidence. So, you know, it, it is a gradual process. So I think and the reason I want to stress that, because we have a tendency to to distance ourselves from uh, issues, domestic violence, bullying, and so on and so forth. Like, it can't happen to people we care about. It can't happen to us. But it is uh, something very insidious, and it takes time to build. So. Okay, let's give a round of applause to this extraordinary panel. What great insights.
Now it's your turn, those who want to make comments. This is a comment period. Just come to the microphone here. Come to the microphone. Those who want to make comments, not speeches, but comments. Huh? Well, I don't want to have to, no. So, but we want to hear from you. In the meantime, while people are gathering, I want to announce that the Counseling Center has a table in the back with flyers and resources on domestic violence in the back. And that is Denise M. DeCoupe, DeCoupe I'm sorry, is at that table. So be sure to get some information. We're, you're, you've been so patient and so engaged, and that's good because this is an incredibly important issue if we're going to create a better world. We cannot create a better world unless we address issues of domestic violence. And you're hearing violence in general. Why is America such a violent society? Whole nother topic. But anyway, let's begin with our, with, uh, you can, maybe can you um, say your name hello. and maybe what department My you're in if is, you choose to. Yeah. My name is Dina Smalls. I'm from the Queens EOC. I mean EOP. Um, I was a victim of um, domestic violence. I'm not a victim anymore. I'm victorious. Um, Towing. Thank you. Um, I do motivational speaking. Um, I tell my story because it's a healing process, not only for me, it's to help someone else. Um, my biggest vision, this is why I work so hard. Um, I wasn't able to finish school with a 98.6 average, but through the Queens EOP and um, the help of Ms. Ali, that healing was able to start from 2009. Now I obtained my GED. Now I'm in the pathways to college. And my biggest vision is to go all the way to my doctorates. I need theology, psychology, and business administration so I can get a building where I can get some of these dysfunctional families and know that there is change. Try to change the parents, but my biggest vision is on the, uh, the children, not to sit around and act like it doesn't happen anymore. Yes, I still have a long way to walk, but like I said, um, domestic violence is not something that should be ignored. It should be brought out. Um, and families, special stuff as ethnic black people, it's like things happen to you when you were a kid, so you don't know how to handle that situation because you're pushed in the corner and said, shh. So we as adults, and I really thank y'all because sometimes I used to think I was alone. But I'm still healing. I'm still not able to date, but I am gorgeous. But um, it's about me today. Wonderful, wonderful. And let's give it up for the Queens Educational Opportunity Center. But y'all just wave your hands. You're always so supportive. The Queens Educational Opportunity Center is always here. OK, next up. And others, don't be bashful. As Ebony Jackson said, this is safe space. There, is no, there are no wrong answers. There are no controversies or whatever. This is an opportunity for people to speak and to testify or ask questions, whatever you have on your mind. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Linda. I'm from Social Work 101. No, let's get the microphone wasted. Oh, I'm too tall. <laughs> my name is Linda Campbell. I'm from Social Work 101. Um, two things that, okay, thank you, that call my attention of um, some of the comments that came from this side. Um, it, selective settings to let the anger out, like we see the athletes and um, how they are able to control themselves in on the field and, and when they're out and about, but in the domestic setting, they explode. And is that caused because um, they were abused in their domestic setting as opposed to being abused on the outside, if that's the reason why it happens there. And another thing I want to mention is that domestic violence includes the kids uh, because the parents have their interaction and when, their anger, um, the, when they are angry, their anger translates into how they interact with the children too. So um, children should be included in this setting of domestic violence, not just like some, um, not just viewing it, but being part of it, because I have seen instances where the, when the mother's angry with the father, then she goes and abuse the kid, either verbally or physically. So yes. they are part of the setting, too. Can I just say something? Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, 
I'm Richard Holmes, and, and I'm a senior at York, and um, I'm a child of a household that was, you know, my mother and my father. You, you know, um, I stuttered all my life, and I believe it's a result of things that, that, that I witnessed as a child. You know, um, I remember my mother telling me that when she was pregnant with me, that he kicked her down the steps. You know, and I remember this, and um, I remember sitting in the car with my father and my mother on this side, and him reaching over me and slapping her. And as a small forest kid, you know, you feel helpless and you're helpless and you're scared and you don't know, you know, you, you know, I was just a kid. See, I, I love my dad, you know, he was good to me, you know. He bought me everything I wanted, you know, and, and everything, and I loved my dad, and I thought that that's how, you know, that that's how it goes. You know, um, I remember him telling me that um, when they got married, it was in the vows for her to put, um, love, honor, and obey, and obey her. Yeah. You know, wow. love, honor, and obey. And wow, you know, growing up, that's a, a mentality that has to, you know, um, people have to be re-educated. Yeah. You know, re-education is the key, man, and you know, and to start time for some changes, you know? Yeah, can I just say that you are a very, very powerful and courageous brother? Thank you so much for your interview. Give him another round of applause. Give him some love. Um, hi, my name is right Uji. I'm from EOC. Speak a, can you speak a little up? bit more directly, yes. Hi, my name is OG. I'm from EOC. I have a question for you, ma'am. You said yelling at a child is wrong. Oh, I'm sorry, it's kind of. Um, did you say yelling at a child is wrong? Because I have, let me say something to you. I work at an agency, I'm an aide. I have this little boy, he's 10. And the first time I came there, they already sacked 15 people before I came. So I was wondering, what did this little kid do to them? Now, the first time I encountered this, I was reading. He was on his mom's laptop. OK. Every time I looked at him, he shifted the laptop. Every time I looked at him, he shifted the laptop. It went on and on. I found out he was watching porn on the laptop. I couldn't yell at him. I went to the mom. Oh, it's part of him. What do you mean it's part of him? It's 10. It's part of him? OK, it's part of him. And the last thing that happened was this little boy saw his mom kissing his, her boyfriend, went to school the next day, dragged a girl, and kissed her. When he saw me, he said to me, oh, I kissed a girl because I saw my mom doing this, and it was awful. Why is my mom so into it? And I'm like, should I yell at this boy or should I just let him be? And sitting out there, hearing you saying, yelling at the child is wrong, it conflicts with. I think I'm not understanding what it is that you think you heard me say. Well, well, let me, well, well. I, I, I really want to get as many comments in. So put a pin in that one. Put a pin yeah. in any of these. Okay. And then we'll respond. But I'm gonna—I don't want to—I want to get as many comments from the audience, and we'll we'll come to the panel for addressing any of these issues. Go right ahead. Hi. So I heard.
heard um, Dr. Rogers and Ms. Terry said something about um, the hitting up the, ch the child, but I know there's some cultures that they do that, and that's just their way of discipline, I guess. So my thing is, as a child stemming away from that and trying not to keep continuously doing that down the road, like, they have to get help themselves. And I just want to let people know, like, just because your parents did it doesn't mean that it's necessarily right and that's your way to discipline your child also or validate it in any way. Okay, all right, very good. Yes, next, next person. Good afternoon, everybody. I just wanted to say, like, I maybe not personally have been through um, domestic violence, but I've witnessed a lot of it. And I just want to say that if you're in a relationship with a man and he's putting his hands on you, nine times out of ten, he's not putting his hands on other men. He's putting his hands on you because you're weaker. And he is not brave enough to do that to anybody else. So don't allow somebody to project their insecurities onto because that's all that they're doing. So if somebody, a man, you're in a relationship with somebody and you're putting their hands on you, don't stay because that's not, that's not right. And I forgot what I was going to say, but. Take your time. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's not right because I've seen a lot of men. Um, um, uh, um, friend I had, she was with somebody and he was hitting her and she ended up pregnant. And now she had to have a baby, and now this man was going to be permanently in her life forever. You get what I'm saying? And it could have stopped in the beginning, but now she's going to have to have this reminder, and now what's going to happen to the child? She may look at this child and feel disgusted because the person was putting her hands on her and stuff like that. So I'm just saying prevention is very, very good, like, because if you stay, you might get too deep into it, and then your ties between this man is going to be so deep. It might be impossible to leave. It might be because you're going to have kids with him and et cetera. So I'm just saying if somebody's hitting you in the beginning, you should get help in the beginning before it gets deeper. All right. Okay. Next up. We'll take these last two, and then we're going to get our panel to respond unless there's some. Yes, go right ahead. So we're getting ready to, if there's others, yeah, come on. Okay. We're gonna try to, I'm trying to get as many in as possible, but we do want to move on. And please be patient. You've been so wonderful. And there's food, too, at the end of the, of the rainbow. So it's going to be, be great. Okay. All right. Good let's, let's make them a little shorter because we got about, I'm gonna, we're going to end it after this last one here so we can get to our panel. But go right ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Stacy Hines. I'm actually one of the board of directors with the York College Alumni Association. And I wanted to find out, is there a way this discipline is across the board, not only just the NFL, but the NHL or the other sports organization, and if the pen penalties could also be as stiff, you know, because I feel like we're just singling out one specific sports organization, but I believe it's across the board. And if, there, if, the, if the penalties are so stiff, can that be done across the board, not only in sports, but throughout um, our communities and um, what more can we do as individuals to make sure that this um, lessens in, um, in happening in our community? What, what can we personally do um, in our community? Okay. Those are my questions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Next. My name is Kate Lesoufan. I am from uh, Social Work 101. I just have one question. How we can make something like that happen in the high school? Because I'm looking around, I with the train and the buses. The young girls sometimes do not even understand they are being abused. Um, I remember the first time I was coming here to register. I noticed something in the, in the street right in front of the college. There's a young girl. She's walking like she's going to fall down. She's crying. Um, myself and another lady, we approach her and asking her what was going on. And then I notice around her neck, you know when somebody tried to strangle you? All the 10 fingers were around her neck. So you can see the marks. So I'm asking her, and then I look down, she was pregnant. I say, what's going on? What happened to you? Do you want me to call the police? She said, no. I said, is the boyfriend did this to you? She said, yes but she still doesn't want to call the police. 
Um, she said, wants a ride to go home. And I said, is your mother home? She said, yes, she will take care of me. So I want to know how we are the next generation. All these young girls who are coming from 14, 13, 12 years old, they start dating. You can see them in the bus with boys just kissing them all over the place, doing things to them and slapping them because I noticed that. They slapping them, they push them, pull them. How we can bring a panel like this to the high school to start there? To eradicate something, you have to start at the root. And I think the young girls are the root. And don't forget the young boy. They also need to be taught not to put your hands in a girl. When a girl said no, no, me no, don't go too far. So how can we do something like that? Right, very good, very good. It's wonderful, wonderful exercise. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dr. Henry it's from the bio department. I just walked in, I just came from another school and I just saw the topic. And I have something quickly I wanted to say on this topic. I mean, I missed all the discussions. I don't know exactly what was discussed. But on this topic, I have something I wanted to say. Typically, I wanted to address those that are in the religious circle. I don't know what comes sometimes with that doctrine that they follow, that they believe that separation or divorce may be wrong. And many times, they are stuck in an abusive relationship. I want you to know that God is a God of love. If you are in an abusive relationship, that means you don't have grace to be in a relationship. He provides you no grace for it. He comes to save you. That means you must get out of this relationship. If you're not ready to divorce, get a separation until you know clearly exactly what you're supposed to do. So violence is not acceptable. Your life is more important first. So make sure you get stable first. So get out of that relationship. It's not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kamru Nahar. Um, Speak a little louder, would you okay. please? Okay. It's okay? Yes. Okay. So I would like to share my feelings with, uh, um, with this audience uh, like that, that I always, and I think uh, everybody will uh, believe on that, that every bad work will come out as a punishment. It will be... Uh, come out in your life as a punishment and uh, always a good work will be a rewarded uh, reward for you. So if we can teach our people in the community through uh, like some uh, events, social awareness and um, seminars and everything, uh, so in that way that don't do any, any bad to anyone. It will punish you in opposite way. So I would like to share one of my experience like that. I met a lady who has four daughters and one of them was in very bad relationship with her husband. And the mother was telling me that only because of me, my, my daughter is in a bad relation. I asked how. Then she told me that whenever my husband used to beat me, used to abuse me, then sometimes maybe but from from my mind, from maybe not un, not intentionally, unintentionally, I may curse my husband, and then uh, maybe sometimes I, I I just pray to God that uh, oh um, he has four daughters. If one of his daughter will be in a problem with 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 her he, with her husband, then he will realize then how would it feel to a woman. So that, that's what I'm trying to say, that uh, we can, uh, punishment uh, or go for um, any arrest and everything will not improve our society. If we are talking about our society, in that case, we have to uh, award our, ourselves, our people. And one more thing is that, that we should uh, also discuss in that way then when the domestic violence in between the partners or spouses, um, the man, especially the men, don't know that when the relationship is uh, have any uh, violence and everything, they are just losing the most beautiful thing of the life, like love and sex. But without love, there is no, no good sex. This is my opinion. 
so if you have to be enjoy the most pleasurable pleasurable thing and the most pleasurable gift of this world and from god you have to be respect your spouse you have to be love your wife or spouse and that's all thank you very, thank much. You very much okay now for the rest you're gonna have to be we're, we're, because we really there's been a lot put on the table we were really supposed to stop after the lady in the red jacket but we'll allow the rest in line but you've got to be 30 seconds. You got to come seconds. and bring your uh, perspective. Uh, 30, 30 I seconds. apologize, but we really want to get the conclusion in, and we want to also make sure that there's an opportunity for people to share and uh, and fellowship. And then people have to get to their classes. So go right ahead. Uh, um, my name is Tali Kensler. I grew up in South Jamaica area, so I, I pretty much experienced. Speak a up a little louder, please. I pretty much experienced like a lot of, you know, pain stuff like that. But I just had a question for you. You said you stayed, but then you left. So are you still? Like married to your, to your sons? Oh, okay. Um, I do believe that, you know, the problem does stem from like those dysfunctional households and how, you know, we interact and engage in certain things with our families. And me personally, honestly, I kind of like experienced a whole lot of detrimental, whatever you want to call it, like experiences. And I got married and I had a son recently. He's nine months old. So, I'm trying to like get over a lot of like the stuff that's like just it bringing that pain, those, mm. like that's those pain and stuff like mm. because I kind of lash out at my wife a lot of the time. So, mm. Mm. and I mean, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. Like I got into like a real physical altercation with my wife like a couple weeks ago, and you know it wasn't out there. But I love her. I love her to death. Um, are you getting counseling? You talk, yeah. Okay. I'm seeking it right now. Um, okay. You told me about a, a, a woman that you helped and she stabbed someone and she's like now presently serving an incarceration term, right? A life? You're about, I'm happy to speak with you about that. Um, afterwards. Right, okay, because we want to get you, the next person in. Because what right. you've said, and I appreciate your honesty today. Right, so. right. right. Um, we, we, we have to wrap. I have to come to can the I next just, I have to come. Can I thank you so much. Quick? Thank you so much for your testimony. It's very important and very powerful. Thank you so much. Go right ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Shivanan Gosain. I'm a sophomore student in sociology. And actually, um, I, I was interested to listen to this discussion because I'm um, doing research on um, gender communication and uh, connection. And actually, um, while listening to the discussion, I come across some biases and that needs to be addressed and, and that for my um, perspective. We, you said you, uh, first, we, st uh, we start with um, two questions. One was, you know, um, women being uh, physically um, be, uh, violated. And then you talk about another one, you know, about men. But then after, you know, most of the address that we addressed um, issues, we always tend to look at it from a point of view of men being violent. Rather than, you know, they are, we, we know that both are violent, but when you address most of the question, it always comes to men. Right. You know, and I just want to point this out, and I see you have um, to join. I don't know if it's part, being part of it or uh, as a person who will get therapy. So I'm sure someone someone will respond to uh, doing the course of the summation. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hello, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Linda. My name is Linda A. I was put it like that. That's all right. Uh, I believe the root of all the problems. It stems from the family. Whether you are one parent or two parents, teaching comes from the house within. You teach your daughter to respect her husband, husband, and then your son respects his wife. And my parents were married 45 years, and I never saw them fight. And my brothers, they never fought their wives. My sisters, they fought their husband because the teaching comes within from the family, religious background too, how I'll do with it, going to church, no matter where you come from, north, south, east, west, in the whole world, you gotta have that teaching of the family within. That is the basic root of everything, respect. 
Respect your wife, respect your husband, respect your girlfriend, respect your companion, <laughs> respect your lover, respect your lover. <laughs> that's all, it. respect, that is the biggest that's the word right there. And it, it, it goes a long way, and I'm 65, and I've never been struck by a man my whole life, my own boyfriend years ago. And I said, because I respect him, he respect me. I respect my husband, he respects me. So that's, that's the thing. They got to be taught in the house. In the house, right there when they're little kids. Teach them right there. Sit down and talk to them. Right. Talk to them. It's right. a simple little thing. Right. Sit and talk to your daughter and your sons. That's all that's, there's to it. Right. You don't have to go out and say, oh, oh, oh I got to be violent. Oh, is it what I got to do? Do something. Yeah, nothing, nothing you have to do. Right. It's nothing you do. I thank all you. I said, and thank you very keep much. Keep your faith. That's all there is to it. Keep God in front of you. It's simple as that, like, a, yes, like my mom and Paul say, one, two, three. Yes, ma'am. I'm blessing you. everybody in the whole panel. Thank Bye you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yes, sir. My, my name's Angelo, and I stand here right now for a Dakota Stewart Dick. I could not sit in this audience without coming up and saying a couple words about someone that worked at this college, and her only sin was that she loved somebody and brought the wrong person in the house. Women, be careful who you go out with, who you bring home. If someone puts their hands on you, run. Don't walk, run. I direct a program here with the help of Dean Cherico called the Grandparents Resource Center. And I represent many grandparents who now are faced with raising their grandchildren. You want to see the plight of this disease? Mm. You go to family court, we have one grandparent in our program whose daughter was murdered in front of her children. I've been to two funerals, funerals. There's no coming back from this. And you can nip it in the bud at home with your own family, with your own kids. You have to be the example. Run. Don't walk away from it. Run away from it. Thank you very much. Finally. Hi, I'm Olga Berwood, um, Dr. Berwood. I'm a new faculty member in the psychology department here. Um, I just wanted to add uh, a thought or two about um, domestic violence. I, I'm actually really, um, I feel very privileged to have been part of this conversation. There have been some really wonderful insights um, by the panel regarding the multifactorial nature of domestic violence. It's a very complicated phenomenon. Um, but what I wanted to add to um, the thinking about this, really, is I wanted to come up to be an advocate for the men, the perpetrators of the violence, um, to some degree. Because there is a lot of focus, usually, in domestic violence situations on the victim, and that's absolutely appropriate. Um, the most important thing in that situation acutely is to get the woman out of the situation. Typically the woman, not always. Um, but what we know about, you know, the roots of violence in large part from the cognitive neuroscience perspective now is that difficulties with emotion regulation are a large contributor to this. I think one of the big reasons why men tend to let go in the household is because it's a safe environment. We walk around all day and we have to appropriately regulate our emotions in social contexts. Um, we cannot lose our job because we have a fit at work. But when we go home, when we're among our loved ones and we're safe and protected, that's when frustration, emotion, and irritability tend to take hold. Self-control tends to drop. And oftentimes, terrible consequences can result from that. Um, I think, in large part, a big focus needs to be placed on an increased, an increased focus in teaching good emotion self-regulation skills in children. Financial and educational resources are necessary for this. This has to happen at a systemic level across all aspects of society. It's not only going to be protective for women, it's going to be protective for children, and it's going to be protective for future men 
And I would really, I just wanted to sort of add the, that. Thank you so much. Let's give all of those who contributed and came to the microphone, give them a big round of applause. All of them, what a wonderful series of interventions. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have summary comments from each panelist. It will be impossible for each of you to answer all of the different questions, so you may want to select one. And you have two minutes only because we're up against the, top, up against the clock and we're up against the class schedule and all that. And uh, I'm going to start on this end because I, have, I want you to do something special once you do your intervention because I think you have a creative piece that I'd like you to end with as well. So let's begin, let's come down. Uh, and there were several things, the question of, of, of abuse of children and how that fits uh, raising the voice of a child, um, the issue of religion and religious sanction for uh, male dominance was another issue. The question of, of sports and whether or not there'll be some uh, penalties across equalization across sports, I mean across different sports, athletic activities, question of curriculum in high school, um, issues of socialization, uh, importance of family, a number of very important issues were raised. Select one. Ooh, so many to choose from. <laughs> well, I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit, touch on some of the comments about prevention. And I think that is really where we can make a big difference and really stop this cycle, is the prevention piece. Start early, way before high school, you know, in terms of uh, prenatal care and giving kids a really good chance uh, in the right path in terms of their development. Um, parenting, you know, if you don't know how to regulate your own emotion and to be able to uh, maintain some self-control, then that's going to be a problem. So work on yourselves as parents so that you can instill these values in kids. Um, and I mean, just again, I think we have to really tackle this in a number of levels, right? individual, family, community, and beyond. Um, and I'd just like to um, kind of piggyback on what Dr. Kirigo said earlier about opportunities missed. You know, every moment of the day, we have the ability to be more awake and aware. There are numerous, probably countless opportunities to open our eyes to see injustices being done. And to be able to, as one uh, young lady came up here and said, you know, she noticed something happening in front of her on, in the subway and was able to point it out. And I think sometimes just being aware and having an outsider point out that out of concern, not out of judgment, and that's a very important distinction, being able to point out concerns not from a judgmental perspective can kind of uh, encourage an awareness of this discrepancy, like, oh, maybe if this stranger recognizes something that I don't see myself, this is something worth considering. Um, so I just want to leave it at that. I know I have yes. time to answer. There, there were too many questions to answer. Um, many of you, because you've taken certain courses here at York, you've begun to learn things. Perhaps in one of your courses, you've read part of Plato's Republic and the story of the cave and people being blind and shackled and then through education, seeing the light, being able to leave the cave of ignorance. Keep in mind that the moral of that story is that once you leave the cave and become educated, it is your responsibility to return to the cave and help other people. I charge you today, I demand you today to finish your educations and then to use your education, your knowledge, your ability to talk to others, to write, to go back and help others. And I don't care what field you're in, whether it's business or psychology or social work, you have an opportunity day in and day out to show the various kinds of respect and care through who you are in the work that you do. So use it, go back, because only you can change it. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to say thank you to um, the Men's Center, the Women's Center, Dr. Daniels, to the panelists to the left of me, to my colleagues to the right of me, and certainly to all of you for being participants. I think that my final comments are uh, just to restate the, how critical it is to mentor individuals. And, and I appreciate your conversation about um, 
not forgetting um, individuals who batter or the perpetrators. And again, I need to affirm that there are individuals out here doing the work and that we need to understand that it happens on a micro, meso, and a macro level. And everybody has a responsibility to address this issue of um, intimate partner violence. And Ms. Williams referenced um, the importance of therapy and we, we need to take into account that that's really difficult for a lot of people, but you're here at York College and as students, we have a counseling center, we have a women's center, we have a men's center, there's 1-800-LIFE-NET if you don't feel comfortable going to have a conversation with people, there's um, Safe Horizon, 1-800-621-HOPE, there are so many different venues, um, go talk to a professor, go talk to a friend who can take you to a professor, I'm a person that I will walk you to the counseling center, um, but I think that piece is very critical, and if we don't do that, then we're gonna to continue to have this issue, this epidemic, this reality that should not be. And I do wanna address quickly two points. To your point about that it's always men um, that are reviewed or considered batterers, the issue is that women experience intimate partner violence at disproportionate rates. It's not to say that men do not. I spent 11 years of my life um, working as a clinical social worker at Safe Horizon prior to being here, and men do come through the doors, but they do not come through the doors at the rate that women come through the doors. Women are um, showing up in emergency rooms at a disproportionate rate. Women are being murdered at a disproportionate rate. So it's not to exclude that men are victim survivors of violence, but we just need to contextualize what happens to women who endure violence at a disproportionate rate. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Go right ahead. Um, again, I want to thank Ebony and all of the panelists for um, the insights today. And I just want to say, um, as Dr. Rogers shared, if you are a victim of domestic violence or if there's someone that you know is suffering in silence, you have the right to be safe from any form of domestic violence. It's not just physical. Oftentimes, abusers never use their hands, but it's about power and control. What does that look like? That looks like maybe deleting your homework. Maybe that looks like not allowing you car fare to get to school. That may look like not letting you um, go out and do things or constantly texting you and stalking you and following you. Those are all forms of power and control. And to the young man who shared um, his personal experience, I want to commend you for being ver verbal and vocal about it because it takes a lot to really come out and say. And to me, I want to commend you for that. Um, I also wanted to share that you're a father now and there are fatherhood groups and programs um, the children's aid society they work with partners who want to stay together who are having um, issues of power and control so there is help for you free of charge i would encourage you to seek help because again you have a child who's now looking up to you for guidance and you can break that cycle so you have a wonderful opportunity to pave a positive path for your own child and break the cycle in your family. Again, I mentioned my ex-husband beat me down and my sons saw my ex-husband beat me throughout my pregnancy. They saw him choke me. They saw him knock me out. And now they're grown men, 28, 25, and 20, and now they speak because I was able to recognize that I couldn't do it by myself. So thank you. Thank you. I just would like to um, say that I'm honored to be in your company. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Are you a student, Sabrina? Oh, you're not? OK. I was going to say, if you were, that it was even more incredible that you, you and Ebony pulled this together. But in any case, thank you for your work. Um, I just wanted to say that I think it's really, really important to recognize the power of sharing our stories with one another. Because that's when you find out that you're not standing on that ledge by yourself. And it was, it was very, very courageous of you to, and you're not the only one in the room. That's the thing, that you're not the only one in the room, but that was very courageous of you to acknowledge that you helped and, um, a lot of people with that. And those of you who did share your stories, that's what it is. We must remove a layer of the mask off our faces and share our stories with one another so people don't feel like they're the only ones. And uh, stay strong and God bless you. Madeline. Now I'm gonna invite Madeline to actually come to the podium because uh, she's also an artist and uh, I think she has a very inspiring way of 
or a way of closing it uh, because art and culture is also um, uh, very important. So. I want to also acknowledge this incredible panel of women up here, and thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for having yeah. us here. Um, always empowering to be around people who are working to make a difference in the lives of others, and I get to learn so much more when that happens and make new friends. So I look forward to continuing to communicate with all of you. Um, I wanted to just also say that uh, from the very beginning of the Ray Rice, Janae Rice uh, scenario, what I find to be the good thing that came out of that, that because this was an NFL issue, it has provided to us an opportunity to raise the level of the conversation about domestic violence nationally and really globally in a way that it has never been addressed before, simply because it was an NFL issue. But I also want to acknowledge that this is not, and I know everybody up here knows that, so I'm not saying anything that's rocket science, that uh, domestic violence and violence against women and children is an ancient crime. It did not start with the NFL, and it won't end with the punishing or you know dismissing or taking away anybody's rights from the NFL. We have this pri this problem in uh, with our clergy. We have this problem within the police department. So this is across the board, and the thing that we must always remember is to fix ourselves, to do what we can to fix ourselves. Young man that came up and, t and shared his story, yes, you're wonderful for doing that. Be patient with yourself, because it takes time to actually undo all the harm that has been done to you as a child. What you witness won't go away overnight any more than it was taken in overnight. So just really realize that geography doesn't change that. Wherever you go, there we are. So we have to fix ourselves from the inside out. And so I'm just going to share with you a piece that I wrote because I, like you and so many people here, the women on this panel, um, believe that this is a holistic issue. It is one that we have to take on as such as a mother of sons and a, and a grandmother of granddaughters and love children. I think we have to save everybody in order for us to heal collectively. So Save Her, Save Him is a part of our, Terry Williams and I have an initiative called the New Legacy Leaders Program, and Save Her, Save Him is one of our projects that deals with domestic violence. This poem was written uh, to acknowledge that belief. With broken hearts and broken spirits, busted hope and less faith too, they walk among us, the weary, smiling on the outside, wearing mask and corporate grin, scowling on street corners, each dying deep within. They are the great pretenders, one and all, riding the subway, driving luxury cars, shoulders back, neck erect, head held regal high, thug bopping, knees bent, swagger. Proudly clutching Gucci bags and grinning ear to ear until they reach their doorstep where false bravado and well-rehearsed pretense begins to slowly disappear. Another safe arrival to that private hell call home where they step behind closed doors now. Heads begin to bow now. No more charm or humility, just a stench of harsh words and unspeakable brutality, baptizing them in shame once again with bloodied mouths and swollen eyes. Upon their knees they weep and pray that tomorrow will come and pass without them, leaving her and him to rest eternal in that quiet place of no return, of no more pain, no more failure, no more regret, no more, no more, no more, only silence. Listen, can you see them, feel, or hear them? 
Listen, listen, save him, save her, listen. Thank you. Give it up, give it up. Well, let me just say that um, I have had the opportunity to moderate many panels here at your college. <clears throat> But I must say, I think this has been absolutely the most informative and productive one that I've had the privilege and honor to moderate. <clears throat> and I think we should give up a big round of applause to Ebony Jackson and to um, Jonathan Quash for doing an extraordinary job. And give yourselves a big round of applause.